Hey, everybody. Welcome to Market Mavericks here on this Thursday afternoon. Welcome, Mike McGlone, Scott Melker. Thanks for joining again today. How are you guys doing? I'm doing great. Awesome. Good, awesome. Good to so, get the Mavericks back together. That's yeah, right. We, we missed week last week. Off. That was my fault. My fault. Sorry, guys. <laughs> that's all good, man. You got to do what you got to do, right? All right. So without further delay, let's start off with crypto, right? So here's your Bitcoin daily chart. We've obviously come up into this double top high, the high pivot from uh, November of 2021. Scott, I'd love to hear your take on what this is, when it's going to break out, if it's going to break out. What are you seeing here? Well, for me, uh, if you bring up my chart, it broke out at 25,000 and nothing to be bearish about since then, in my humble opinion, right? You had a series of uh, lower highs and lower lows going all the way here. For me, when market structure changes is when you get that new higher high. So and you can see, and I've been kind of screaming about it since then. So when is it going to break out? I think it broke out at 25,000 and here we are at 69,000 talking about new all-time highs. Uh, I'm admittedly a bull tard when it comes to crypto, so uh, so no is no there, mysteries there. <laughs> is, uh, w all right, so let's say let's say it breaks out above sixty nine, whether it's now or in a week, or what? What's your bull case for the rest of the year? Like, how high could this go, or your estimation? I mean, listen, there's a blue sky breakout to me is the most bullish thing that can happen for an asset. I think that uh, if we get above that and stay above that, we have a historical precedence of doubling in 18 days. I'm not saying that'll happen again. I don't think it will. But every single time, except for the 65 break that we only hit 69, that was a very big, big uh, divergence. But we've had basically these incredible moves to the upside. We saw it go from 20 to 40 in a matter of uh, a couple of weeks and those things. Yeah. But uh I just listen. I know you guys have your bearish cases. I'm very interested to hear about them. I I just this looks like a train that's running out of control, and I, I would not want to get in the way of it. I can see taking I, profit. I, I will see take, taking profit. I agree with yeah. you that it's a train. I mean, it is it is a powerful move. I mean, even that flush of 10k just the other day, it recovered you know 80 percent of it within a day, basically, right? So I mean, yeah. it is a train. The question I guess I would have, and I'll throw it to Mike about this, is is this because Bitcoin is unique and it's got its its own kind of thing, or is this a risk on trade that the stock market is catapulting, or maybe it's both? I mean, I kind of lean in the both category. Yeah, well, I, I can tilt over to a few charts. So Bitcoin, gold, and the S&P 500 are all making new highs. <laughs> I mean, okay, so beta is definitely driving. And I, what Scott said really resonates is that's a goal. What we're supposed to be doing in life is have profits to take. Um, it's just a question of how overweight you can let your portfolio get. So I, I show here is uh, and something I'll probably be publishing on tomorrow. And key thing I like to point out is if you just look at the performance of um, gold versus the S&P 500 right since the end of 2021, which is right before the Fed started tightening, it's a significant period. Gold is beating the S&P 500 total return by 5%. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin and gold were hovering around here. Remember, this is when I wavered. I admit, got to own your mistakes. I wavered on Bitcoin, but it proved wham. Now it's beating the S&P 5 total return by 30%. And the key thing is now the market's starting to price for eases. I, there's no environment for eases, but this is something that we're going to discuss. And, and, and uh, you mentioned pre-show, uh, Gareth, we're going to talk about is the key thing I'm concerned about is Bitcoin and gold have both had cleansing correction this year. Bitcoin was almost 20% peak to trial. Gold is about 5% peak to trial. And beta is what I show you here in S&P 500. This is a chart since the bottom. And it was actually on S&P 500. It was, it was uh, October 27th, straight up. And the worst week was the first week of the year, minus 1.5%. That's it. So when you have a market that just goes straight up without corrections, great. I get worried, but it's beta. It should carry everything with it. The key thing I'm looking for at some point is when it does have a drawdown, and at this point, you can't say yeah, if it's just kind of sucking everybody in like a black hole. What does that mean for Bitcoin? The key thing you have to point out is Bitcoin is showing pretty significant divergent strength versus that risk. And we all know when beta goes down, Bitcoin should drop more in gold, but we haven't seen that yet. Yeah, so, and I would like to point out really important that, Mike, we've been talking about this for years. People forget that you were a huge Bitcoin bull, right, uh, for a very long time and that you still are, I think, long term. Big picture, but, oh, yeah. It, but if you have, if you are a trader, you have a idea or level of invalidation and you have correctly yeah. pointed out for a very long time that Bitcoin was leading, right? But, the, but part of that premise, and you and I talked about it on Spaces, was that Bitcoin hadn't made a new all-time high, S&P, nasdaq they were continuing to do that where's the beef right you always said it bitcoin lagging but now with bitcoin back at an all-time high it's hard to say it's a leading indicator to the downside 
Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that. It's one thing you, you when you've been doing this for a long time is um, some people remember when you're right, some people remember you remember when you're wrong. It's oftentimes reflective of their positions and personality. And um, I, I like to point out is the most important thing for me to do is own my mistakes. And I'm not perfect at it, but that's just so important. And so that's probably why I don't trade anymore. <laughs> As my former boss said, Mike, you say it better than you do it. In the long term, you can't pass the fact of the simple declining and defin definable diminishing supply. And we know we're going to get that in April. The problem is what happens after April, that dangling carrot of, of the halvings over. And increasing demand and adoption. And right now, we're at about the best stage you can possibly get for that. The best Nothing ever fl inflows. Yeah, best ever inflows for ETFs in Bitcoin. I, and stuff I didn't expect. I thought most of the environment would be people do what I've heard in commodities forever well where's the total return where's my earnings but that was that was a revelation at the etf conference back almost a month ago was man everybody cared about bitcoin i'm like i get it yeah <laughs> can i point something so, out in that regard yeah. because um i think what's been interesting and maybe i didn't predict and many others didn't predict is how steady these flows would be and there's actually a very fundamental reason for that and that's because yeah. we're having progressive unlocks of rias and institutions and mm -hmm. individuals slowly yeah. getting access to this so we didn't end up having a situation that i think a lot of people expected which was you open the tap and anyone who wanted to buy bought immediately what actually happened was you got some buying interest that we all know higher prices and more buying interest leads to higher prices and more buying interest. And as it's unlocking, there's actually this FOMO. Another RIA adds their, this to their platform. Merrill Lynch opening this to yeah. their people, which they didn't. And you look at these numbers. I was talking to Juan from, uh, from Bitwise today. Bitwise is at, where is it? They're currently at $1.84 billion. That's Bitwise, which is in the middle of the pack, right? BlackRock at 12 GBTC at 27. The expectation was we might have five total in six months. We're at the same market cap now for the Bitcoin spot ETFs collectively as GLD. Same AUM. Yeah. So I mean, I, it I is insane. I want to point that out in the chart that I, I, I appreciate publishing a couple of weeks. I'll point out facts of what I'm shocked by is there are significant outflows in gold ETFs, despite the fact it's an all-time high. Why? Well, China's a big buyer. So that's diverged the strength in the old metal. But that also is juxtaposed with significant inflows in Bitcoin ETFs. Now, how much of that is going from old gold to digital gold? I don't know. But this is what I like to show you in chart. You look at the gold Bitcoin cross. It's almost at the old high. The old high was right around, what was around 37 or 35. And it's at 31. But that's a no, no. We all know that. Here's something a lot of people don't know. It's happening in futures too. Bitcoin futures now at an all time high. What I show you here is just the change in open interest in Bitcoin futures. You could expect that from 2020. I mean, that was again, right before COVID. Yet gold open interest in futures, this is listed stuff on CME is declining. And if you look at just the last year, one year to date, Bitcoin open interest, um, futures open interest is an all-time high. Again, that's the listed all stuff, the high. institutional stuff. And gold is um, basically flat. It's up 6%. So it's happening everywhere. And you know, you, you don't mess with the tape and you don't fight the money. <laughs> it's all going to Bitcoin. But gold's at high time too, all time high too. So I, that's kind of gonna be the fun part of how we're gonna end what, this year. How that's Mike, gonna work why out. why is gold and Bitcoin? I mean, generally gold's a safe ass safe asset, right? When markets fall, when people get scared. I mean, is it is it institutional buying? Is it I mean central banks, gold China, is that why we're seeing these all time highs on gold at the same well, time as risk assets? The word the World Gold Council used for bank uh, buying of gold from China and some other institutions was colossal. They've never seen that much buying. And then you have to rope in what's happening is th that's why I love the macros. We just had this big debate in the U.S. and we we beat each other up. And guess what? We approved Bitcoin e um, ETFs in the U.S. And what's happening in China? Push back on those. And they are buying gold at a colossal pace. That's one person too, Mr. Z. It's it's shocking what's happening in the macro. And I think people, you don't usually get these till the past tense. And that's also that Mr. Z has tilted back over to the bad guys. That's Russia, North Korea, and Iran. And the rest of the world's like, okay, well, so they're loading up on gold and the old tangible asset and more of the, the newer world like us are just to prove the old, in, the new intangible digital version. And, you know, you get to the point where you think about stuff I, I read, you know, Saifedean Amos in his book, uh, Bitcoin Standard, I read that, was it six years ago now, when he predicted that central banks will start buying um, Bitcoin? Like, man, it's been going that way. <laughs> yeah. it, it is going that way. Yeah.
I so agree. what's I mean? So from you guys, what's what's the bear case? So I I know it's hard for you, Mike. Uh, Mike, well, Mike, maybe not so much, but Scott, you know, you're such a bull. Is there anything that can derail this train? Like, well, yeah, you there, had there's pl there's plenty of things. So yeah. I, I I'm I'm bullish now. This is what I've said to you guys on the show many times. I actually share in your guys' macro thesis. I just don't share in the idea that the Fed won't kick the can down the road as far as humanly possible. And what's surprised me is how many levers they have to pull to continue to manipulate things mm -hmm. to the upside, right? That, that's what surprised me. But I, yes, I obviously get a huge market correction in general, recession, depression. Those would massively derail Bitcoin. If we're talking about it from a technical perspective, the same reason I said on the way up, if we make a lower low at some point in a macro standpoint, I'll turn bearish. That's what happened. Listen, I was bullish still at the 69,000 top. I turned bearish when it flipped below 52. I never really got bullish again until we were back above 25. But... I did buy dips the whole way because I had go. confidence. I had confidence that A, I could be wrong and B, that we would eventually get back to 69,000 because I believed in the four year cycle and I believed in Bitcoin long term. So the good thing about being a bullish uh, tilt indefinitely is that as long as you're not using leverage, you probably get proved right eventually. I tweeted this the other day as dumb as dumb as my dip buys at 52, 42, 32, 22, 17 looked on the way down. They all look pretty good now. And that's exactly what happened to me when I dollar cost averaged SPY through the entire Great Recession and felt like I was going to be homeless by the end of it. The problem with shorting actually all the way on the way up, obviously, is that you get stopped out because you have to use leverage to do it, right? So you can be bullish and wrong as long as you have a low time preference and a high timeline. It's harder, I think, when you're on the short side. But for me, if we make a lower low or something fundamentally changes, if we start to see massive outflows, guys, this is a small nascent asset. When you're getting $700 million a day into BlackRock's ETF, the price literally cannot go down fast. It can't. Leverage can, get, leverage can get swept like it did the other day. You can lose a billion on the leverage side. But just as you said, Gareth, look how fast and hard it bounced on the spot covered, side. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let me piggyback on that. I came from futures in Chicago. I was born and raised on leverage, typically 20 to 1. And for example, leverage, when a typical person buys a home and puts 20% down, that's 5%. That's five times leverage. So to me, and just like fractional reserve, leverage is good if you manage it properly. In this course, like everything else, it can be mismanaged. It always it puts in extreme. So I like to show you the chart. The number one risk we have I think it's part of the reason I'm still quite bullish gold is beta. Now you look in the total return of the S&P 500 this year, it's 8%. That's a pretty damn good year. And it's only, it's not even, what are we, March, uh, March 7th. Um, so that is what's happening. We're getting this FOMO black, it was a black hole. Now Bitcoin is becoming that. But if, if beta keeps going up, yes, of course, everything's going to be fine. But we know, and that's what I show you in this gap. Now we're 10% above this gap. That's never happened. And this is S&P meetings on a weekly basis. And I look at it, it's like, oh, boy, now I'm worried about it. We all know what happens when you go up in a straight line, very low volatility environment. When you correct, you go down on the elevator. We're going up on the escalator. And that's what happened. So what's happening also is what really struck me in commodities two years ago. It was a high price cure. They went up too high. And that's why they're in a pretty severe bear market now. It's happening in equities. And that's what I show you on this bottom line. This is Fed funds expectations in one year. They've been this Fed fund futures, they've been going down means they're taking Fed fund expectations for easing out of the market as the stock market goes higher. Now, despite what we heard from Powell today, he said, yeah, they're ready to cut. It is somewhat, I think, inconceivable or irresponsible with deflation market, inflation, their metrics at double their targets. Um, and with this massive speculative rally in equities and cryptos for them to ease in that environment, that could be considered historically as one of the biggest risks in history um, and biggest so you look at the Fed standpoint, why should they have to say it? They might be easing, but to actually do it. And then if they want you to cut 25, that might be it just to appease people. It's just in that kind of environment, inflation above target and actually picking up following financial assets. Actually, we're creating the wealth effect and massive speculation in things like cryptos to ease in that environment. And from my background with tracking the Fed for almost 30 for 30 years is that would be kind of odd. Yeah, well, there's no reason to, to ease right now, right? I mean, the jobs report, I mean, jobless claims today were still below 220,000. Jobs numbers on ADP on Wednesday were fine. I mean, there's really in stock markets at all-time highs, cryptos essentially at all-time highs. Doesn't make sense for them to ease, but I agree they, you know, they with testifying on on Capitol Hill today, 
we did see, you know, Jerome Powell continue to say, yeah, you know, maybe a, a couple rate hikes later this year. He's got to leave the door open probably so the market starts they're, they're, totally kick, they're, they're kicking the can endlessly down the road yeah. with vague language and have never changed their tune. They're not cutting anything. And the only reason that they would, and I've been saying that, Mike, you and I have been saying, we've been talking about this a lot. I've been saying that literally the whole time. So I'm not yeah. wrong. I was saying it a year ago at this time when they were pricing in three cuts for 2023. Yeah. And I said, there's no reason for them to cut. There's no reason for them to cut. The only reason that they would cut right now is if the fiscal side wants to get involved with the monetary side. The only reason they would rationally cut, which is not the mandate of the Fed. The Fed's mandate is jobs and inflation. But do you think we do have a problem, which is that we're adding a trillion dollars in debt every couple months. And that those bills come due and they have to refinance. So if the Fed wants to get involved in that, then they would cut because it would obviously improve the situation for refinancing that debt. But that is not their mandate. That would theoretically be a form of manipulation, but they might just do it. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, too. I mean, I think you have about seven trillion in, in treasuries that have to be essentially redone this year just because of that debt rolling over. And, you know, that's probably at one to two percent right now. And it's going to be refinanced essentially at four percent or so. So I, I do wonder. And again, it Back. begs the question of if inflation picks up, because I mean, I've even heard people saying no rate hikes this year and maybe even rate hikes. Maybe there's a need for a rate hike again in the future. But again, how do they continue to hike rates with the amount of debt that, that the country has at this point. I mean, just, you have corporate debt too. I mean, there's so much debt laid in system out there. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I think that just comes to whether the, you know, we have fiscal policy on one side and monetary yeah. policy on the other, and they don't always align. We saw that a lot last year where you talk about tightening on one side, but then we're issuing bonds by the trillions, you know, and the fiscal side is effectively printing money while the, uh, while the, excuse me, the monetary side is effectively printing money while the fiscal side the Fed is effectively tightening. It doesn't make yeah. much sense. But if they come together to work on that, that's how I could see us getting a cut. So now, otherwise, so, no way. So I do want to turn our attention now, kind of take the next step. Let's move over to the S&P and the equity markets. You know, we've touched on that, obviously, but we've been mostly focusing on crypto. But what, you know, you look at this S&P 500 chart, Mike, you know, and, and all we've done is stay in this tight range since October of 2023. So it's almost six months at this point, right? Um, and look at how tight this is getting. And we're coming into the jobs report tomorrow. Yeah. I think expectations are something like 190,000. I don't know what it is. Um, but are you expecting a breakout, a breakdown? I mean, at some point, you've got to break out of this wedge pattern. It's too tight. Well, that's the thing. But typically, what's the, the, the direction of the most pain? Up and then down. Down and then up is meh. It just... That's what it's been doing. Right. So, to put in a this is this is the kind of activity. And first of all, I have to admit I've been wrong. I show you in this chart that what you show in that chart is typically how you put in pretty significant long-term highs. When you go up on zero volatility and everybody gets in, they have to be in, and then eventually it reverses, and that's what you're doing there. And I, I show you in the same chart. And you just tilted over to what I'm showing is is what I'm like to point out um, on the chart. You just for me is um, I'm showing you that this is the gap. You know, and e is just take S&P 500 going higher. And as it goes higher, Fed fund futures taking out easing. But what's ha happening, too, is this was the, the Bitcoin gold ratio was stuck around 22. It broke above that resistance. Now it's taken off. And that is where I look at it. It's like, OK, that's pretty, pretty serious. But that's why I look at is the number one factor is going to be how Bitcoin and gold respond to beta. Now, when beta does have a drawdown, I didn't say if it always does. Typical to get back to this gap now is 10%. Before it was 5%. So you see what the, where that bent is? Maybe we won't ever have that drawdown. But I've heard, I've seen people, I hate to say that have committed suicide, <laughs> ex traders, and get stopped out for saying things like that. But it's just at some point you have to expect this to happen. Let's just be rational here. Is we're up 8% on the year. Um, and it's so early. These are the kind of things that you have to say, oh, okay, thank you. Be careful. So here, I'll give you one anecdotal example. Is, um, at the start of 2020, some of the smartest money managers I know, people you never talk to, but run a lot of money, were just loaded up in equities, mostly energy. And that's why I spoke to him because I'm an energy guy. So I was at an ag conference last week and some of the wealthiest people I know in Illinois who did then own a lot of land or way loaded up on equities back then, are way underweight equities and buying T-bills. And one of them, one example was one, one guy's son said, my son has 11 Bitcoins. He had 10 before and he's buying more and he's really concerned. I'm like, well, he's got problems of creating, of making too much money. 
<laughs> nice. So quick question. One more follow-up question, Mike, when this is something that I'm, I'm intrigued by. So number one, the VIX, right? So we are now in a period where we've seen, you know, volatility so low for so long. We know how rare that is, but again, VIX continues to be well below 15. It's been there for a long period of time, but going back to the S and P we've seen upgrades to price targets on the S and P from all these big firms out there. Um, I, why are these are, are these are the supposedly the smartest guys in the room, right? Are, oh, yeah. is, are do they really believe that the S&P is going higher or are they just I, playing I'm, catch up? I'm, I'm glad you went there. It always happens. It's classic human nature. They have to downgrade reluctantly. So when we go down and they have to upgrade on the way up, if you're if you're missing out, you're fired. I mean, it's just welcome to the street. Welcome to being a manager. And that's what's happened with all RAs right now. Everybody's chasing it. And it's the eight neighbor rule. If your neighbor's making more than you, you're going to go to his manager. But that's where you get to those points where you can put in enduring highs that we talked about with Scott. I remember them in the past. It just, I gosh, it was a feeling I got working for Japanese firms in the 90s and that, oh, it's never going to stop. And I got that same feeling about um, China about 10 years ago. And now it's starting to kick in. So that to me is where you really have to be careful um, and I, like I said, that's why I had to mention the smart, real money people I know are underweight equities and saying thank you and looking for alts. And one of them, obviously, out in the Midwest, it's land. But um, that 5% T-bill is comparing. But I want to end uh, on this. As you mentioned the VIX, I, I haven't had time to pull up the chart now. But if you, what I've been enjoying doing is taking the VIX and, and subtracting out the T-bill rate because it's, it's really important to do that because sometimes the VIX is reflective of what you're getting um, and because it, it really measures it back to the past. If you do that, um, and you're, you're do, showing a bar, but the VIX versus the T-bill rate is around nine. And if you compare that to the, the significant low in 2006, which got me really bearish equities, I was just early, it's near on like a 20 or 30 week basis, it's nearing that low then. So meaning you have the most complacent VIX since before the great financial crisis. And like, great, good luck with that one. That's end. But the difference is you have T-bills at 5% and you say thank you and load up. So that's also a thing that's happening. We were thinking that you'd see money flowing out of T-bills in, into, uh, I'm sorry, into money markets, into, into Bitcoin ETFs. It's not happening. You're still seeing increasing. So I think what people are doing, prudent money managers are doing it. See if you had $10 million and it's up 25% on a one-year basis. You've got $12 million now, right? Or almost $13 million. Just scare enough the, thir the $3 million, put that in T-bills, and you're still in the market. But you have to or you're overweight. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think it goes back to the old adage, markets can stay uh, can yeah. stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. This has proved that, I think, more than any market I've seen in a very, very long time. Oh, because yeah. the, no matter what it think it should. Like, Gareth, you drew that wedge. Yeah. Right? What I see is that we made a new all-time high and it's a blue sky breakout. You ask what I would do on Bitcoin if it breaks above 69,000. I think yeah. SPX right now is showing you what you do. You got above 48.18, blue skies. Can't really try to time the top at this point. So maybe maybe the answer is that if you bring up my screen really quick, yeah. maybe this is actually the answer, right? If, you, if you're actually looking for shorts, this is your short, right? You don't try to catch yeah. the top. What you do is you wait until you've lost that uh, all-time high again or some fundamental level, whatever it is in your charting. And that's maybe when you start to have pause. But while we're still above the previous all-time high, um, I think you just, you know, the, the trend is your friend till the end and when it bends, you know, and uh, <laughs> it, we've been in an uptrend. I mean, look, this is, a, it's just insane. And you can go back. We've done it before. So trying to think that you might catch the top without a fundamental reason, really, really difficult for me. That's why for me, it's always been like, even in a, a bear market, I'm more inclined to just buy dips uh, and wait a really long time than I am to try to aggressively short it. Uh, that's yeah. just the way I am. I, I don't short Bitcoin, certainly. I don't even have a way to short altcoins <laughs> as an American, really. So I'd rather just uh, take the beating that people are going to give me when I say, hey, I bought Bitcoin at 35 on the way down. And they say, what if it's not the bottom? Well, OK, guys, give me two years, you know, and here we are. So so at least I you know, I can't get liquidated. But right now it's blue sky breakouts. I, I just don't think there's a bear case until the chart shows you that we've lost some sort of level. Do you have any other assets that you're super, super bullish on, Scott? Like, uh, you know, like oil or or anything else? I mean, or is it just I, like Bitcoin all all the way? I, I, I'm just I, I don't have the attention span when I'm uh, focused on this market so heavily. I just see that the headlines for other markets and I see what's happening with Bitcoin. I, I mean, like I said, I, I spoke to Bitwise today in the last week. They've signed up three RIAs that this hasn't even gone public yet that are all going to allocate 
1% of all of their funds into Bitcoin spot ETFs now that they have them. It was a 1 billion manager, a 500 million manager, and a 2 billion manager. We saw Carson Group, 30 billion uh, asset under management, RIA, last week uh, approve four of these ETFs, right? So like I said, we can play charts all day long. It's my favorite thing in the world, but sometimes like there's just, this is a small asset. It's only a trillion dollar market cap, 1.3. With that much money coming in, it's just can't move the other way yet. I'm not yeah, saying well, that, it won't. We will get 30, 40, 50, maybe 85% corrections. I have no that, idea. But right now we're going into the bull market, not coming out of it, in my opinion. That, that is a significant bid below the market. I suspect you're going to see more of that responsive buyer. But you did mention oil, Gareth. So I have to pull up my chart yeah. I published last week on oil and copper. They're both in that narrowing wedge pattern. This is copper and orange, and this is oil, and maybe WTI gets 83 um, maybe copper gets in there for, but everything is kind of awaiting. And this is happening with beta making all time new highs. Remember last year we had beta 20% discount from the highs. That's where beta is the most. I, I've never seen a period in, I think maybe in history where the U.S. stock market continuing to rise, certainly in my lifetime, matters more than now. And that's why I say that risk of beta just reverting a little bit that we haven't had everybody knows got to at least have that little five percent drawdown haven't had that that's when we have to we're going to see the truth and that's why i look at it if from professional money managers are looking at this and that's where what i would do with clients i remember doing so you replace that you get gamma you buy calls and call spreads so you get the gamma on the upside for this beta and even the um, discount i'm sorry bitcoin's a different story and then maybe protect you a little bit but you just don't want to have that that flush risk when when we do have a drawdown. It's a question, and you, you never pick tops. Um, here's um, he who had picked tops. Uh, well, it just um, you get you, you lose your hair. Yeah. So so do you think that you know? So basically, what you're saying is that because copper and oil are are bearish on the charts, it's telling us it's choreographing that we are heading towards a recession. When does that recession hit? I mean, because everyone right now, I mean, listen, you go out on the street, everyone's like, buy yeah. NVIDIA, you'll make a million, buy Bitcoin, you'll make a million. The economy is going to be a perfect soft landing. The Fed's a genius. Obviously, you don't agree, right? Well, no, that's the key thing. It's we. It's the risk of the delay. So here's my, my bias. By the end of this year, we're going to have just a simple little bit of reversion of the pendulum swung way too far towards recession a year ago and it swung way too far towards perfect perfect soft landing this year but from a commodity standpoint the world is almost completely tilting towards recession i show that in the declining industrial metals declining energy declining grains and only one key commodity going up gold that's a sign of a global recession or tilt now you've seen it in canada in australia latest in finland mostly europe in germany and japan and you have the second largest country country in the world japan i'm sorry china completely dependent on fiscal monetary stimulus just for stabilization they china because of one person is heading towards a severe depression in my view just looking at the data and studying the measures of history that's where i look at is the whole world's depending on this u.s stock market can go up and u.s economy do well but the stock market's leading indicator if it starts just when it does have the normal drawdown the deflation or domino risks are what you would expect from the back end of the biggest liquidity pump in history that's dumped and that's the point is we haven't hit that we're, we're in a great goldilocks stage right now and yes mcglone has been early but one thing's look at bitcoin's been doing great in that environment it's just that's why the whole world is clearly in recession can clearly from a commodity standpoint it's a global economic contraction tilt I know wow. we only have one more minute, but I was going to ask you guys, and Mike, you kind of gave me the answer. Like for for me, I guess the invalidation of my bull case would be a lower low. What's the invalidation for you guys of the bear case? I mean, Mike, I guess you said the correlation up. Like, Gareth, is there a number for you as you asked me, like, where do I get invalidated on the bull case? You still had the bearish thesis. Where do you get invalidated on that? Yeah, so so my only bearish thesis for Bitcoin at this point is just honestly expecting a market correction of significance right and I, when i say that i mean stock market so so other than that this is a bull market in bitcoin there's no other way now i'm a swing trader so like you know i'll short the 69 high and i'll try to cover at the retrace to the scene of the crime which was around that 4950 level and then i'll just back and forth but right now i mean essentially if this stock market does not correct and the fed does lower rates and liquidity floods in 
then Bitcoin's not going down. I mean, not more than like a correction like we saw the other people day. Think 10, so, people think you're such a bear. It doesn't sound that way. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm a swing trader. So like, you know, I'm in and out. Like just yesterday, a couple days ago, I covered a few shorts for like 20%. Dogecoin, I was short. But again, I'm a quick trader. So overall, I'm a huge long-term bull in Bitcoin. I think it's the future. I think it's the digital gold. But also, I'm a shorter-term trader. So I'm going to take advantage of supports and resistance levels and just trade them accordingly. Well, it's so back you, at 68,000 right now. <laughs> what, what you are is the essence of what's important in markets. You help provide that liquidity. And with yeah. your discipline stops, I hope you can make money and will make money over time. A lot of that kind of trading has just been banned in China. It's classic sign, not banned by one person. Classic signs of how bad it's getting. That's crazy. All right. I think on that note, guys, we should uh, wrap it up. It's been an amazing stream. I love the fast fire action here yeah, today. And I think amazing viewers today, guys. Amazing to have almost 8,000 live viewers here watching this stream. So thanks, everyone, for coming out. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Scott. And uh, let's do it again next Thursday. Hell yeah. Let's go. Let's take care, guys.